I was really excited to see this conversation take place because I think it's a great opportunity to talk about how communication breakdown in a relationship is rarely a one-sided issue. Usually there is something that both partners or multiple partners can do to improve the issue and to grease the works a little bit. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. My name is Mickey, I am a therapist and we talk about therapy things on this channel. This is part two of the Married at First Sight video. If you have not watched part one yet, I will put it up there in the thing, I think, I don't know. Um, it's somewhere. <laughs> but this is part two. We're just gonna jump right into it. Um, and so if you have not watched part one, I highly recommend that you do that first because I, first of all, explain explain the premise of the show. But also we are not really like doing like a, a ramp up into it. We're just getting into it. So um, you might be confused if you've never seen the show before. Thanks for being here. Okay, love you the most, bye. Okay, well then go in an A room. I don't give a which room it is, but please get away from me. Go for context, Dr. Pepper recently had a visit with these two in which they talked about their conflict resolution. And one of the issues that they've had is the leaving, which you guys saw earlier. Dr. Pepper advised them to not leave the apartment and if they're having issues to just sleep in the guest bedroom. Um, so they're arguing now and Elizabeth is saying that she wants him to sleep in the guest bedroom. Go to a room. I don't care which I one you choose. I, I well, then leave. You're sitting here threatening that we're done. I can't even go have my own space. Dr. Pepper sat right here and said that we're not supposed to leave. This Dr. is our Pepper home. Dr. Pepper isn't me, and Dr. I, Pepper isn't you. Say it was good stuff. Mm -mm. Yeah, it was but, really good stuff if you listened to yeah, it. Yeah, I did. And you know the last thing she said before she left? Just be nice to each other. Be tender. I have. Be kind. Be Jamie, sensitive. she was only gone like three hours ago, honey. And you snapped at me because I. I you were dragging my dogs. I know, I wasn't walking the dogs yeah. correctly. Yeah, imagine someone taking your two-year-old and handling them wrong. That's your child. I wasn't intentionally mishandling them. I'm sorry, I wasn't intentional. Okay. I wish you would have had a little compassion for me. Kind of like when I had a UTI and you had compassion for me then. Yeah, I And then I just tried to tell you that I think we should pause on sex. This, I wanted to dissect this a little bit. They're both guilty of doing this, and I don't mean to pile on Elizabeth here, but this pattern of... I wish you would have had compassion for me. Oh yeah, well like you had compassion for me when this happened, cut it, not useful to you. Because when we do this and, and we like compete with our partner for how the other one is more fucked up than we are, we're not getting anywhere. We are competing with each other instead of addressing the problem like Pastor Cal was talking about earlier. And fundamentally all we're doing is pitting each other against each other. That's not going to end in a resolution that's helpful or feels good. Because even if you do win, even if you do verbally beat your partner into submission, they're not gonna feel good about it. And that's not really fun for anyone. And there's gonna be resentment that builds. So I really wanna encourage people to structure your communication in such a way that you're able to, again, like listen for the sake of understanding and try to extend a little bit of compassion and validation for what your partner's trying to communicate and then when they're done, check in with them. Is there anything else? Like what else is on your heart? And then when they're done, say, okay, these are the things that are coming up for me. I hear that you're wanting compassion, but it's really hard for me to extend compassion because I asked you for compassion and this didn't happen and it really hurt my feelings. So I'm not in a place, blah, 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 blah. It's a much more helpful way to work through the things where we each feel like we have space because when we're like competing for the speech space, again, we're not gonna get anywhere. We really should. And that, it didn't mean that I wasn't attracted to you. It just means that we need to have our relationship come to a more like grounding area and not just focus so much on sex. I don't think it's focused just it on It really sex, is but... focused on a lot of sex, honey. It really is. It's funny how you went a little crazy after I I didn't said, go a little crazy. I said that. You don't makes, have sex anymore. My it's exact words to you, funny. I said, that makes me feel kind of pushed away and rejected. And I said, it's going to be hard to sleep in the bed next to you knowing that you're intentionally holding me off. You don't think we should do that? Do what? take a break on sex and actually like have a real relationship honestly, like where we connect honestly, another. that seems to be one area that we're kind of getting it right right now did you know your first time in risotto this is something that we will talk about later um they address it with dr viviana so like let's put a pin in that remember that they talked about that we're gonna talk about it later yeah i'll it's... shake your risotto virginity <laughs> how's it going iris thank you <laughs> what did you think about the fish bugs exercise? In all honesty, I just, I wasn't in the right headspace to. 
for context, the fishbowl exercise is where the experts take a fishbowl, they put a bunch of pieces of paper in them, and the couples pull pieces of paper out, and they like do things or answer questions and blah blah blah. Part of their, this couple's like shtick is that Iris is a virgin, um, and so they're working through developing sexual intimacy and trust in relation to that area. The fishbowl exercise that the experts gave them was specifically themed around sexual questions and sexual topics and Iris became very uncomfortable and like clearly was not feeling it and Keith was frustrated by her what he perceived to be a lack of maturity surrounding the exercise. We did not include that footage because I think it's clear that Iris was very uncomfortable with having that filmed and it just felt wrong for us to like broadcast it again. And again it's available on Hulu if you guys really want to go see it but I don't think it's necessary for us to talk about this conversation so. I don't think I was either. I know that I for sure went into it kind of like this is going to be this is going to be a headache versus just going into it and just letting it rock. For real. And for real. you know, I'm going to start trying to do more of that. How, how do you feel up to this point? Like what's your, like if, we were, if there was a state of the union? Well, I feel like my needs are being met intimately, but I still don't really know like what is intimacy for you? It could either be, you know, verbally or physically. Sex has a lot to do with intimacy. Mm -hmm. 100%, I do feel that way. I don't want you to feel like your your needs are not being met. I think, you know, in, in the past, sexual maturity is something that has been attractive for me. Mm -hmm. So I think that is one thing I can think of that, you know, kind of is, you know, it, it's, a, it's an obstacle right now, mm -hmm. you know? Now on a scale of like one to 10, mm -hmm. we're talking about emotional maturity. Mm -hmm. what, what would you consider yourself? Probably a 6.5. Because the most is that I've always dealt with myself are my own personal emotions, you know what I mean? Sure. So being able to be mature enough to give those emotions and feel vulnerable, it's really hard. That's real. Mm-hmm. This is such a good example of healthy communication and healthy disclosure. She was honest, she was clear, she was concise. She was, you know, appropriate in this disclosure and I'm excited that they showed us this because I think this conversation was probably difficult for her to have. It's hard for us to honor the ways that we are maybe not meeting our partner's needs and I think Iris handled this situation with a lot of grace and a lot of maturity. Honestly I think she should rate her emotional maturity a little bit higher because there are a lot of people who would struggle to honestly evaluate the ways in which they are not yet meeting their partner's needs with this very even keeled affect and she did a really good job of that and so I think this is exciting. I think what sex does a lot of times it forces you to become emotionally mature. Absolutely. In, in all honesty you being a virgin it is something that I do think about and it's you know it is a you know a genuine concern for me. It's, it's tough man. It's you really think tough. that that's like a negative about our relationship? is my virginity overall. Um. It's, it's a concern. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a concern. Knowing what intimacy means to him worries me because intimacy in his eyes is still some kind of sexual intimacy, which I know I can't give to him at this point because even though we're married, I still only known Key for three weeks and the level of trust and comfort that I need just isn't there yet. I wanted to talk about this because I like that this was included. I saw that someone mentioned Iris and Keith in the comment section in one of my previous videos. So I was very interested to see their interactions and honestly they were like the least problematic couple um, or one of the least problematic couples of the season in my opinion. I think that they have very different perspectives about sex and intimacy, but I don't know that they're necessarily wrong. Like neither of their perspectives are really wrong per se. Iris is correct. Intimacy doesn't necessarily have to be related to sex. There are a whole host of other ways to be intimate with your partner and sex doesn't have to factor into that at all or ever if you don't want it to. And so I do kind of disagree with Keith a little bit in that he talks about sex causing you to become more emotionally mature because not all people who never have sex or don't like sex are emotionally immature. But he is I think allowed to say that he finds sexual maturity and sexual intimacy attractive and, and finds that to be something that's important in a relationship. But yeah, I don't know. I just, I wanted to talk about this because I think these two people are good examples of how we can have differing perspectives and neither of them be necessarily wrong. And for us as a couple to come to a conclusion 
where we're honoring that our partner just thinks differently about something and we don't necessarily have to have like a big knock down, drag out fight about it. It just, it is what it is, you know? How big on the scale then does my virginity play in the role of, you know, your ultimate decision with everything else? I can't, I can't come, I can't say exactly how much uh, yet, you know? No, not yet. Waiting for grandpa to hear you. Wow. Who's grandpa? <coughs> the only other person that's in the room. I'm sorry, can you hear you? What? The only other person that's in the room. Having sex with my wife last week was amazing. I know that she's been sick this week, but now that she's feeling better, I mean, I really hope we can work on that part of our intimacy again. <laughs> um, since my birthday, I always wonder, like, what what triggered it? What was there something that happened, or it was just it was just the moment where you was ready? It was just like seeing you hang out with your friends and having fun and just like relaxing and not thinking and just living in the moment. I wanted to talk about this because I love that, this is Deanna and Greg, by the way, unapologetically my favorite couple of the season. Uh, <laughs> I love that Greg's response to figuring out how to have more sex or intimacy with his wife was not to say we should have more sex but he noticed we had sex this one time and granted she's been sick for a week but you know she seems to be feeling better now and we haven't had sex since then and so instead of saying I want to have sex why won't you have sex with me he said what can I do to meet my partner's needs and how can I show up for my wife in a way that will cause her to feel safe and comfortable and excited enough about me that she'll want to have sex this is a very healthy example of how to communicate and operate within a relationship because when our, we feel like our needs are not being met or we feel interested in something that our partner doesn't seem to be interested in at the moment, usually finger pointing and poking at our partner is not the most effective way to get it. And so doing that reflection to figure out how can I be a part of this solution is a really great tool and I think something that we could all learn from. Like this was a light bulb moment for me too, where I was like, oh my God, why am I not doing that more in my own marriage? Um, so I love this, like full, wholeheartedly support this. Um, again, also I'm super biased because I just love Deanna and Greg. And that turned you on? Yeah, because I was like, oh, I haven't seen that side of Greg before. So going forward, in order to continue this intimacy, how does that work? Do I need to continue to bring my friends over or? No, I just think that you just don't think. Just just be real, just just don't think. It happens when it happens. And if it happens more, it happens less. Like, I don't, I don't know. If we were to have sex every other month, once every other month, would you be okay with it? Yeah, I would just make that one time every other month be like mind blowing. I don't care how mind blowing it is. I don't think I could do that. Okay. I definitely know that sex is something that Greg likes and that means a lot to him. So that is something that we'll have to figure out together. But at the same time, I also want him to like let go, like release a little bit. Like you gotta live in the moment and when you live in the moment, things happen that you can't explain. I'm not. See, and she communicated that to him. She's about to communicate it some more. But I think again, this is a great example of how we can communicate to our partner and still validate our own perspective. Like neither of them conceded on what feels important to them. Neither of them had to let go of something that feels really important to them, but they made some space to understand and to validate what their partner felt was important also. Always gonna be like, I have a list of this is everything that turns Give me, that me on. List. I don't Give have a list. Send it to me. There's not a list. I don't, you know, share your feelings as often, so I don't know how you feel. Okay. Differences. Um, differences. I feel like we are different in so the way. So how about this? I'm gonna stop you. So different, but then also I mean how we compliment each other. Not just like, you know, people say, oh, we're different and then they like bash. I don't think you're gonna do that. Well, but no. it's something how we, how we compliment one another. Okay, so you don't want the differences. You just want how we complement each other. With our differences. Okay, so what I was gonna say... Can you give me an example here? Nope. You sure? I feel like sometimes Greg tries to, like, mansplain everything to me. I'm like, oh, well, that's irritating. Like, did you even <laughs> want me to have the conversation with you?
Yeah, I mean, I feel like most women have this experience with male partners. Um, this is an example of not so great communication, and we'll unpack this in a minute. You're gonna, you you're like gonna continue you mansplaining? Like you like you're, you're gonna continue to mansplain like as I'm trying to. You, seem like you, don't but you know what? Her. How about you, you go like first? Make you go first, though. You're, 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 you're good. First. I'm done. The first one. Nope, I'm done. Yeah, see, I think. They unpack this later with one of the experts, but he was joking and she was not. And so this is why learning how to read your partner's nonverbal tells is also very important. Their tone of voice uh, is very important because I think it was clear that Diana didn't think it was funny anymore and she was feeling hurt and angry. Angry. <laughs> she was feeling hurt and angry, but he didn't pick up on that because he thought they were joking still. And they talk about it later and they figure it out. But yeah, again, it's also important to make space for your partner to talk, obviously, but I think everybody knows that. Elizabeth and I had a fight a few days ago, and right now I am questioning the marriage, but Dr. Viviana is coming over and the timing could not be better. Hopefully she will apologize for the way she acted in front of the other couples, because I'm not gonna be a part of the marriage where that's okay to act like that. Just really quick, that pushes my buttons because the reason that she had like a blow up in front of the other couples at some like organized event that Married at First Sight made them do is because he told her to shut up in front of the group and in front of a bunch of other people and it hurt her feelings. So like, I think we own some equal responsibility here. I can, just, you can reprimand me. I don't have anything to say back right now. You can act like you don't care. That's fine. It's much easier to not care than actually care and you know talk about what happened and actually show some remorse. I need to reserve my energy for Dr. Viviana too. So if you have anything else to just yeah, I got, a, I got a lot of things to say. And oh I'm continue boy, discussing beat them. me down even more, more, person. Please keep going. You and I can get mad at each other behind closed doors. It's a whole nother ball game when you ruin everybody else's day that's within earshot of you. You embarrass our marriage. You embarrass me personally. You've certainly embarrassed yourself. You embarrass the other couples. You embarrass everybody. I wanted to talk about this because I think it's a little bit bizarre that he made the choice to speak to her in this very aggressive way right before Dr. Viviana comes over. I'm confused about why now felt like the time to voice this in such an aggressive way knowing that there was an expert whose job it is to help you mediate conflict. I'm not really understanding why we did this. Honestly, it just seems cruel. I don't really understand why someone would see their partner saying like, I need to reserve my energy for Dr. Viviana. I feel beaten down and like clearly having a hard time. And for them to say like, this is my moment. I'm going to jump on top of her right now. Like that pushes me and rubs me the wrong way. When you told me to shut up in front of everyone, I was embarrassed. I felt stupid. And everyone around you think that that's okay and no one even says anything. Yeah, you're gonna ruin everyone. I thought day. it was okay. Then Your why mom? didn't anyone take up for me? Jakey, damn it, why didn't anybody take up for me then? I'm so sick of this. so sick of this go away then go away are you happy no let me guess you still have more to like rip me apart about don't you you still have more issues with me then go away you've embarrassed me in front of everyone you've made me look stupid in front of everyone so yeah i'm gonna react i'm gonna defend myself yeah i have days where i snap and you do too but you don't do that to people so yeah jamie you know what i did overreact and i was a bitch you're right I was and I own it 110 percent I own that and I've ass of yourself I know I don't need you to sit here and point a finger at me like this like see that's what I'm saying I don't understand why I think it's clear again maybe this is one of those moments where I'm having a hard time separating my therapist brain from my human brain but it seems clear to me that she is super hurt right now we're acting from a place of fear this is purely performative like the pushing the table the being uh, inflammatory to me reeks of fear and embarrassment and shame like the, I think that these two people also had a hard time with being documented um, and being filmed all of the time and so it's odd to me that Jamie would see his partner in the middle of this emotional meltdown and say now is the time for me to say you made an ass of yourself like I don't understand 
what the goal of that communication is and it certainly it's not conflict resolution because it just pushes her buttons more and especially knowing that Dr. Viviana is due to arrive in like I don't know 15 seconds it's a little bit wonky you do all the time I'm under magnifying glass with you, Why would you I'm not so tired let me finish I haven't asked you to speak yet hey, you asked ask. me what I want so I'm gonna tell you I didn't need to be no. asked this stop this is a relationship stop Stop! Why even throw out the B word? Really quick, before we get into this, I also wanted to say, in case anyone is confused, the yelling, the screaming, the pushing of the table, all of that, not an appropriate way to deal with conflict, not a healthy way to communicate with your partner. If you find yourself in this place, time out. Time for us both to take some time away and to collect ourselves and to feel how we feel because we're not going to communicate about anything in a healthy way and we're certainly not going to get anywhere. All you're going to do is potentially put your partner in a place of fight or flight and depending on what our knee-jerk reactions are to conflict, we could both get to a place where we're being very aggressive and that's d dangerous, honestly. Don't, yeah, just give yourself permission to take a break and honestly, I would encourage people to try and monitor your emotions so that we're not getting to this place in the first place. But if you find yourself here, I really want to encourage people to take a break. This isn't a shameful thing. It's not a thing that is a sign that you're a shitty person. It's very human, but again, it's not helpful for conflict. So like really want to encourage the adult time out there. We do that to each other. It's because we just want to hear each other say, no, I want you. So y'all use that as a way to reassure one another. It's a tool. It's like a defense mechanism. Did you know that that's what was going on? No, I didn't know that. So can y'all name at least one way that you would each be able to receive reassurance so that when you're looking for reassurance, you don't go to, well, let's throw away the marriage and see what they think. My reassurance to Jamie would be we were in an argument and I look at you and I say, I don't want this. It doesn't mean that I don't want this marriage. It means I don't want this argument. And that's a really big reassurance saying that I'm trying to back away from the drama. That's a great idea. I wanted to comment on this because I think Dr. Viviana handles this well, where she asks them both for something concrete. This is a useful skill for all of you who are like training to be therapists, asking for concrete things and you're asking for feedback from each individual person is good buy-in from your clients because you're asking them to participate in the session and you're like basically asking them to put some skin in the game because you, the things that they're committing to doing are things that they've come up with on their own. So you're not giving them homework assignments, they've come up with it on their own and together. What's something else maybe that you could do, a sign for her, you're just looking for reassurance and you're not trying to leave the marriage. You know, I hate going back to sex and like talking about sex and then the actions don't really follow through. Just because we're pumping the brakes on sex doesn't mean that we're pumping the brakes on our entire relationship. That's not what we want. I just want to back it up and learn how to communicate without just using sex. What does sex mean to you? I don't know. It means like being connected to somebody and having like a deeper special bond that you just don't have with other people. Okay. When she says, hey, I think we need a few days without like having intercourse. You go into this, uh-oh. What's happening? Is she gonna leave me? What's going on? Is she? Is this the beginning of the end? It's all about feeling insecure. It's all about needing that reassurance. You're right, sexuality is something that can really bond people. So it's sex and connection. It's sex and healthy communication. It's sex and quality time. It's all of those things. I don't hear her saying, I don't want sex with him. It's more like, let's have more things that we're focusing on and build and grow. And I think that could be a really great way to then also have more assurance and, and get that reassurance in different ways. So this is something that I wanted to talk about because someone tagged me in a video on TikTok. If you don't follow me on TikTok, by the way, you should follow me, I'll put it on the thing. Someone tagged me in a video about the heterosexual double bind, which is a very interesting thing. I'll try and link to the videos in the description so you guys can go watch them because she summarizes it in a way that is much more succinct um, than I probably will. But essentially the, the premise of the double bind is that people who are socialized in this society as male perceive intimacy and 
sex to be a way of building connection. Because men are positively reinforced for engaging in sex, they view sex as something that is less vulnerable than emotional connection. Because again, the inverse is true of emotional vulnerability. Men are often stigmatized for expressing emotions and for expressing how they feel. And so they perceive being emotional and being vulnerable with a partner to be a very vulnerable thing. Sex is not. And so they think, especially in the early stages of a relationship, sex is a great building block for the relationship. And then once I feel secure after we've had a lot of sex, then I will open the door and give you a window into how I feel and into my emotions. Women feel the opposite because women are stigmatized for having sex and are oftentimes negatively reinforced for having sex. And so we perceive sex to be a very vulnerable thing. There's also a lot of violence against women and like those types of things that impact the way that women view sex also. However, women are socialized to view emotional disclosure and discussions about emotional vulnerability to be commonplace and something that we're very comfortable with. So the inverse is true. Women feel it necessary to have these emotional disclosures and lots of conversations about our feelings and our thoughts in relationships before we feel comfortable and safe enough to have sex. And so we see now how they, these things are at odds with one another. This is something that is apparently well documented in the research. I'm not personally well versed in this. Like I said, someone tagged me in this TikTok and so I've done some cursory um, <laughs> searching about this. But I wanted to talk about this because this is a common issue that comes up in relationships. This clearly is an issue for Jamie and Elizabeth in this particular scenario. And so if you're noticing that coming up for you, having a conversation with your partner about that might be useful. We'll talk more about that in a little bit because uh, Jamie has a conversation about that at the very end. But food for thought. I thought it was an interesting thing. Like you guys said, it is hard work, but I also think that one of the main things that I've realized about marriage is it's good to ask for opinions and suggestions, but don't feel like I have to do exactly what other people did because I don't have to be like them. Uh, something that I learned about myself, I do not like to talk about feelings. If you ask me a question, I will, I will answer your question and then I close it down. It's like, it sounded like a yes or no answer. So I gave you a yes or no answer and that was it. Which doesn't really help. If I only give him a yes or no answer, I, that leaves room for him to create his own story from this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jamie, how she just, just interpret that your own way. Oh, that's what you were trying to say? Yes. Oh, okay. That is so true because that's what I literally do with Keith. If he doesn't tell me. We make the story ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, it's like puzzle pieces and his puzzle piece is missing. So I'm like, well, then these two have to go together because <laughs> I'm not getting any, anything else from you yeah. to know. Somebody just had to interpret it in my own mind. I think this is a great topic of discussion because it's great information to know this about your partner if they have the tendency to do this. This is a very common thing that people do when their partner is not particularly uh, vocal. We have a tendency to try to put the puzzle pieces together and, and make up our own stories. Brene Brown talks about this. Um, and encourages people to use the phrase, the story that I'm telling myself is, something that I encourage my clients to do too. But I think this is also something useful to talk about because if we are recognizing this in ourselves, it's important for us to take accountability for that and to communicate with our partner about that. In the same way that we can ask our partner to increase the amount of disclosure and communication that they're having so that we don't feel apt <laughs> to try and shove the puzzle pieces together, we can also hold ourselves accountable to say, hold on a minute, do these puzzle pieces actually fit together? Or am I trying to shove them together from a place of fear because I'm feeling left out of the loop? And if that's the case, maybe I can invite my partner to communicate with me a little bit more. I was really excited to see this conversation take place because I think it's a great opportunity to talk about how communication breakdown in a relationship is rarely a one-sided issue. Usually there is something that both partners or multiple partners can do to improve the issue and to grease the works a little bit. Uh, so especially when we're talking about improving relationship satisfaction, I very much want to encourage people to be willing to take accountability for the way that you're impacting the overall impact on the relationship. And I try really hard to, of course, be patient and wait for him until he's able to open up and, and say the things that he really wants to say. But in due time, I'm like, well, dang. Because I never had to be accountable of anybody else's feelings. And as only child, never. I'm like, it's me. Love y'all. You know what I mean? But it's not like I'm ever being selfish. I just never had to. So I'm learning all that day by day. How's it going, sir? Good. How are you? I don't know whether to hug you or sit here. <laughs> 
really quick. That's what I mean when I say that everyone brings stuff and baggage to a relationship. That's not like trauma, right? But that's a perspective that Iris has about relationships and about communication based on her own life experience. And she learned that through this experience. It's important for people to know that about themselves and to honor that she is still learning about how to default to think about the emotions and considerations for other people, namely her partner, because she hasn't flexed that muscle very much. It's not a fault, but it's something that's important for her to be aware of because it's something she brings to the table. I'm a hugger. I call Mario because I want to better understand Beth. He's known her for quite a few years and he's seen her at her best and he's seen her at her worst. And so with decision day looming, I definitely have some unanswered questions. So I'm hoping that talking with Mario will help me feel a little bit better about decision day. I know you have a big decision coming up. I'm like eager, eager? to find out like oh, man. how things are going. I mean, it's a lot to jump into like marriage and all that in right. such a short period of time. How are things? Things are good. Um, I mean, being brutally honest. Well, that pause wasn't good. <laughs> well, I mean, it depends. Like right now, I'm like, yeah, 10 out of 10, no question. Right. But then when we're having issues, I'm just like, oh, I don't know if this is working. And like, I've left a couple of times and gone home and spent the night because I've been so like, just down on it. And just like, this isn't gonna work. So what are the parts about it that you don't like? So that way I can even the playing field. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll tell you this. I've had a lot of fights about sex. Beth is kind of a contradiction sometimes. She says stuff like, your penis is made for my vagina. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give me a warning before we can take a hard <laughs> start. Sorry, sorry, man. I'm just, I'm just getting straight into it. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a good thing that your wife should say. I know, but a lot of times when we go to have sex or I like try to like start fooling around, you know, she's like, I'm just not in the mood or it's just not the right time. So she... This is something that I wanted to highlight. It's possible for both of those things to be true at the same time. This is a question that I ask my clients all the time. Is it possible for both of those things to be true simultaneously? Yes, the answer in this situation is yes. It's very possible that Beth is telling the truth when she says that she feels like his penis is made for her vagina, but also that when he tries to come on to her, she's not in the mood or she doesn't feel like it or she doesn't feel safe or comfortable enough to have sex. Those two things can be true, and I think it's important for us to honor the nuance in those situations, especially around the topic of sex. He looks at it like, if we're not connecting, I can't have sex. Like, it just doesn't, why would she want to have sex with you? Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not just saying like that, but that's fair. like... I appreciate the honesty. Why would, she, why would anybody, you know, if, and with their partner that they're not connecting with? But there's nothing wrong with the way you feel either that, okay, when everything else isn't going great, we have good sex, that will bond us. Mm -hmm. But she's exactly the opposite. She's like, this bonds us so we can have sex now. Y'all are like two opposite ends. Jamie's a good guy. I think he actually really wants this to work. He's just going about the wrong way. I think they both are. But they keep focusing on the wrong stuff. Like, you're in this. You are married. You have to make a decision pretty soon. This is it. So I just want to make sure whatever relationship they build is going to sustain. This, again, is like the epitome of the heterosexual double bind. And I am glad that we included this because essentially what we're talking about is two partners who are trying to seek a sense of safety in the relationship. And I am hopeful that they went to some kind of couples counseling after this show wrapped. Um, they're still together. So I'm inclined to say that something good happened because it seemed like they were really having difficulty at the end of the show and then they're still together. So maybe something, they went to therapy or whatever. But when we distill that down to its purest form, essentially what we're talking about is two partners who are trying to figure out how to feel safe with one another. And when we communicate that in that way, it makes a whole lot more fucking sense why Jamie feels compelled to have sex all the time or why Elizabeth feels compelled to not have sex all the time. And so if you're finding yourself in a situation like that, first of all, I want to encourage you to go to couples counseling. It can be very transformative and wonderful. Um, there are always links in my description to find therapists, but also I want to encourage you to do some reflecting about what is the core of this issue. Maybe this is the particular topic that we are having a disagreement about, but when I dig deeper and when I think more about the actual core of the issue, what is the thing that I'm feeling and what is the thing that I'm looking for here? 
and try and communicate that to your partner as clearly and as plainly as possible. Because when we really whittle it down <laughs> to bare bones there, it can make a lot more sense um, and help us and our partner, our partners to get on the same page. And that's super, super important and like very much a relationship skill and something that a lot of people don't talk about and I wish that they did. So, Woo. okay, we've taken many breaks both for camera batteries and for my batteries. Boop, boop, boop. If you made it this far, I want to say thank you. Um, let me know what your guys' thoughts and comments are in the comment section. I would love to hear um, how y'all are feeling about this or if there's anything that I missed that you guys would like me to talk about. We are planning to cover more Married at First Sight. There are lots of seasons, like I said, um, and my husband and I are currently watching it still. So more to come. Generally, too, I wanted to talk about how this show, <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with the format of this. I don't necessarily think that this is a healthy way for people to find a life partner. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing per se. I know that there are a couple couples who are still married and seem to be happy, but I think it's worth noting that the success rate of this experiment is pretty damning. I think there's like, what, nine couples? Nine, 10 couples that are still together out of nine seasons, which is like 40 something couples like 40 plus couples. Um, my husband and I actually did the math and it's less than 25%. So like not the best. I don't super love that there are licensed professional uh, or licensed uh, and credentialed professionals um, participating in something like this. But for the sake of TV show and for the sake of us, you know, dissecting people's communication tools, we'll continue to talk about it because I think it's interesting. Um, and I think there is, again, like useful content for us to learn and, and talk about here. So don't misunderstand. I'm not like married at f first sight's like biggest fucking fan. I don't like love their format. I just, I am addicted to drama. So, um, that said, I hope that you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what your thoughts and feelings are in the comments. If you guys have anything that you want me to cover in the future, let me know. Um, like I said, we're still watching the show. So more married at first sight to come. Um, we're also planning on covering 90 day fiance at some point when I get around to it. Um, and that's it. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go subscribe, like the video, um, and then share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow. And I will see you guys next Saturday. Okay. Bye. Thank you.